Hello and welcome to a special vlog on the medium term budget speech by Tito Mbueni. This is brought to you by the Institute of Race Relations. I'm Gabriel Krauser, a journalist and analyst with the IRR. So we had a very serious talk about this yesterday. Uh, Herman Pretorius hosted a, an hour long conversation with uh, Chief Franz Crenier, our uh, Chief of Policy, Anthea Jeffrey, and myself. And we got into the numbers, we got into the policy, we got into the serious stuff. There's the numbers, but then there's also the theater of politics. And I think that uh, Tito Mbueni is a really theatrical character. I think he presents, um, he's funny, he wears old shoes and, and is famous on Twitter. And uh, there he is with his little alloferrix, which he insists is a metaphor for the country. It being that uh, few, no fruits have been born yet, I suppose. Anyway. The point is of this video is to just look at some of the ad libs, some of the moments that uh, Tito took to say things that weren't in the written speech. We receive the written speech like most journalists beforehand. It's embargoed, so we can't talk about it until it's actually been delivered. But it does give us the opportunity to see the difference between what uh, he was supposed to say and what he felt he had to say. And, uh, and some of it's serious, some of it's funny, some of it's very concerning. And I suppose that's where we're going to start. Uh, the, the biggest ad lib to have caught the media's attention is with regards to Tigercliff Hospital, which uh, is situated in the West Cape, Cape Town. And uh, Tito was talking about how the success that the government's had in dealing with COVID, which is uh, a success I can't understand. Uh, and if you read the Daily Friend, you'll find our analysis on, on the government's failures, uh, both in combating the disease and in protecting livelihoods. Uh, but anyway, he was saying the success is so great that private-public partnerships in health are going to go forward, and this is sort of paving the way towards the NHI. And uh, then he wanted to spell out in, in, in particular how these successes are going to play out. And just as he was doing so, he fell off the rails and felt that uh, South Africans had to know that there's a real scandal brewing. Uh, Alex, play us the clip. Hospital projects in KwaZulu-Natal such as the extension of the Chief Albert Lutulu Hospital, and in the Western Cape, like the Tigerberg and Klepfontein Hospitals. This, by the way, this Tigerberg thing, this Tiger Hospital. Here it thing, comes. It still has a black and white section. There's a section where blacks used to go, the section where whites used to go. So structurally, structurally it's still shot. there. So the thing has to be removed. Has to be removed, has removed, and uh, a completely new, new um, uh, hospital constructed there. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. There, there are. There? I, I thought that was the DA government there. <clears throat> and there he gets the laugh line. So, you know, was this meant seriously? Is this a joke? I don't know. He definitely got a laugh line at the end there when he pointed the finger towards the DA. Certainly since I lived in Cape Town briefly uh, in 2008, there was this urban legend that the hospital was still racially segregated uh, because, they've, you know, someone had seen a sign 10 years ago that still said Blancas of Ni Blancas. And, uh, and this urban legend just had brewed for the, for the next 10 years and now another 10 years after that. Uh, does Tito and Bueli really think that if a hospital once had a wing for white people and a wing for black people, that you have to destroy the hospital and build a new hospital to get over structural racism in that hospital. I mean, that's what he said. Does he really think that? I'm not sure. I think it's insulting. The DA has stood up and, uh, and, and spoke out unequivocally. The MEC of Health said, you, you, you're insulting healthcare workers that have put their lives on the line, that have put their bodies on the line, that have sweated hard hours this year to protect people and have been innovative in coming up with uh, therapies uh, and, and medical treatments that have really saved lives. So it's the wrong place to go for a, for, a, for a political point scoring joke. But if it is a joke, the question is, who's the punchline? Now, the sympathetic interpretation is that Tito Mbaweni is actually making fun of the idea of structural racism. Like if a building was made with two wings, one for black and one for white, then you've got to destroy that building rather than repurpose that building. Alternatively, it's just a moment of him going crazy and going along with this actual idea that structural racism means that if something started out racist, you can't improve it, you've got to destroy it. And, and, and I don't know. I think that's a perfect uh, 
It's a perfect little video clip to capture a, a really deep disagreement between the moderate majority of South Africans who, who think you, you've got to take what you have and improve it, and the radical revolutionary fallists who think that if anything at any point in its past had some problems, burn it down and let's start all over again. So that first clip gives you a sense of uh, absurdity, a kind of theatrical absurdity that demands the South African public to actually read into what's being said in a way that you would expect from a poem or some kind of strange play, but not from a medium term budget speech. Here's another example of that. Uh, Tito Mboweni is talking about our borders, which are extremely difficult to get through if you want to go through legally with uh, freight to do business, but are perfectly easy to get through if you want to do so illegally to gain residence. Uh, anyway, he says this needs to be addressed, uh, and they've got some plans for how to do that. They're very strangely phrased, and then he ad-libs just at the end, and I think if you just listen to how he says it, you can tell exactly the bit that wasn't written down and that he's, he's just throwing out there. Give us a go. Today we announced further steps to make cross-border business easier, including inward listings, loop structures, and corporate foreign borrowings. In other words, exchange controls. <laughs> In other words, exchange controls. So I don't really know whether he means strengthening or weakening exchange controls. There's always some kind of exchange control at a border if people want to bring through currency. Um, but exchange controls have been a huge part of Tito and Buweni's interest, both locally and internationally, where he's been looking at other country central reserve banks that have been undermined. Mm. Um, and part of the issue is that if you want to go through with prescribed assets, if you want to go through with monetizing the deficit, which is a fancy way of saying using inflation to make everyone poorer so that it's easier to pay back the loans that the government has borrowed in rands, then the natural thing for everyone to want to do is sell their rands and buy dollars or euros or yen or RMB or whatever it is. And so then governments that are trying to do that, that are trying to drive up inflation to make everyone poor but save themselves from the debt crisis that Tito and Buweni spent most of the budgets be talking about, they make it illegal or they make it much more difficult to sell your rands to buy dollars. That's the classic sense of exchange controls. And it's, uh, it's like prescribed assets like EWC. I think to people who are concerned about the country, it's this, it's this sort of red herring word and it's nowhere in the speech. But Mboweni sort of just subtly throws it in there. And it does give the sense that he often gives, especially on Twitter, of him being the reasonable voice in the cabinet who sees what's happening and wants to tell you what's happening so that you can help him resist it but knows that if he says it too loudly or too clearly, he could get fired and then get replaced by David Masondo, who's a card-carrying communist, his deputy. So he tries to do it in subtle ways. So it's a little bit like, uh, you know, it sounds like a cry for help, that little throne of exchange controls. Of course, I could be reading too much into it, but of course, when the last thing he said was that there's a hospital that you need to tear down because it used to have a whites-only wing and a blacks-only wing, you know, I feel like it's my duty to to read into things, to try and understand what's actually going on. Okay, so this next clip is probably my favorite. I think it's the most important. I think you should really take it very seriously because Tito Mboweni makes a very serious point. He says, we're asked by some people in the party, why don't we just spend our way out of the crisis? We've got 16% quarter on quarter economic contraction. We've had a real economy that's been shrinking since 2013. Why don't we just spend more money? You know, sometimes you're in trouble, you don't know what to do, you spend more money and then you hope that you're gonna make more money. Why don't we do that now? And he explains why. He says back in 2009, when our debt to GDP ratio was 32%, for every rand that the government spent, it could expect a one rand 60 GDP increase because you spend the rand to hire a construction worker and the work that he does is actually worth a rand, but then, so you've got a building that's there and then he's buying chips and Coke or investing or saving or, or buying a car. And that adds to the economy too, because those sellers then use that money to, to buy further. So it used to be a viable idea, but guess what happens when you double the debt under Praveen Gordon? And uh, then you double it again, effectively under Ramaphosa and and lockdown. 
Uh, well, you get to the point where every time you spend a rand from the government's point of view, you get less than a rand's GDP. So it's actually shrinking things. It's it's no longer useful. Uh, so he makes that point, and and then look at how he tries to drive it home to the socialists and the you know, the ANC, the EFF, the members of the tripartite alliance, who who just won't listen to reason. One run spent G in GDP terms, one run sixty. It's in two thousand nine. Now, however. At such elevated real interest rates, every additional rand gets less than a rand in GDP. Mm. The situation has changed. As John Maynard Keynes said, when the situation changes, I change my mind. Don't you, sir? You have to okay, change just your pause, mind. Pause Otherwise, there. Otherwise, you suffer from what? Just look at those guys' faces. They, these ANC members are, are being told, we, things have changed, don't you change your mind. That is an ad lib. And by the way, the actual quote is, when facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? And it's the question, what does the ANC do when facts change? When it goes from being the case that uh, government spending is helping the economy to it being the case that government spending is not helping the economy. What do they do? Well, Tito Mbaweni is about to explain to you what has happened, what, what his fellows do. What we call an Urklapi approach. Irrespective of the situation, you just keep moving. Even when there's a flood in front of you, you just keep going into the water. Perfect. Horrifying and perfect description of what is happening to South Africa. We are walking into a flood we are walking into a debt trap we are borrowing two billion rand a day we are getting to the point where we're spending more money on paying interest on our loans than we are on health care throughout this country we are taking away money from the police and education from schools and giving it to soes including saa and that's the next clip so I love that Tito Mboweni loves Afrikaans because Afrikaans is one of the best languages in the whole world to, to cuss someone out. An oog klappi, an oog klappi of when you're just looking and doing the same thing you were doing, walking into a flood. That is a, it's poetry. It is poetry. We've got poetry in parliament and, uh, you know, if we've got nothing else, I suppose let's just acknowledge what we've got. But the biggest urkklappi of all is SAA. And I, I think the best ad lib, that last thing was an ad lib, but the next ad lib is maybe even better because he just doesn't say anything at all. There's this pause for five, six seconds where Tito Mboweni is reading his speech and it's all been going well and he's just said how they're going to help out the land bank and people clap for that. And then he got to the bit in the speech where he's looking down and I can tell you what he's reading because I know the speech he's reading. It says, we are going to give 10.5 billion Rand to SAA, even though the Minister of Finance has promised again and again for years that we're not going to do that. But it's in the speech, so he's going to say it. And you can just see the wheels spinning in his mind uh, as he confronts that part of the speech. Ten point five billion rand allocated to SAA. <laughs> now hold on, hold on. Let's go back and see that again. Let's go back and see that one more time. Just watch as this pause unfolds. Oh, oh, that's what I've got to say. Oh, ten point five billion rand oh, is allocated to SAA. Aina to implement its business rescue plan. Aina. Well, let me repeat. <laughs> he said 10. once he's got billion rand is allocated to SAA to no no listen to implement its listen. business rescue plan. Oh Lord. Oh Lordy Lord. You know, it's a shame. It's a crying shame. And yeah, and that DAMP's face right there, it just says it. It's like, you know, some people are tweeting out about this, some people are shaking their heads. But she is just frozen there in disbelief. 
and I feel her. It is, when I saw that in the speech, I, you know, I wasn't surprised in a way because we'd, we'd, we'd already seen that the capitulation had happened. But just for it to be made official or officially put in there again in the midterm budget speech, here we are in the worst economic crisis in the new South Africa's history inside of a recession that started last year, inside of real economic shrinking since 2013. And what are we doing with throwing the country under a plane, under a gravy plane? It's shocking. So shortly after that, Tito Mbaweni gives another little ad lib that makes it so clear that he is reluctant to be doing what he's doing, which I like because it shows that he's still thinking, but he's uh, also not acting. And the sort of compromise, the sort of compromise position, the way that he's compromised himself is really perfectly exemplified in this clip where he ad libs shortly after the SAA uh, budget announcement, bailout announcement, to say something that he feels he's been saying in private, but he, he wants to say in public. Let's have a listen. We need, however, to make it clear that the continuous funding of inefficient, non-functional state-owned enterprises has to be reconsidered. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you why that makes me laugh. Because in my head, I'm hearing, we need to make it clear that bailing out inefficient, non-functioning SOEs has to stop, has to not have happened, has already been a bad thing has to be one of the top priorities of what we need to end, has to be the easiest thing that we can do to substantially improve the state of welfare in this country and signal to investors that uh, if you pour your money in here, it's not just going to continue to be looted. But instead, you get literally the ad lib of, of desperation and of compromise. The continuing bailouts of non-functioning, inefficient SOEs has to be reconsidered. Guys, here's an SOE that's inefficient, it's not functioning, and we're giving it money. Let's just think about that again. Let's just, let's just, you know, see, maybe, maybe not. Can we just at least think about it? I mean, this is the finance minister of the country addressing the National Assembly of the country. This could not be more serious, but it sounds like, I don't know, it sounds like a, a stoner I hung out with on the weekend is like, you know, I'm hungry and there's food over there. Maybe I should eat it. I don't know. Like, it's very confusing. It's very confusing whether we should continue giving money to SOEs that are inefficient and non-functioning. Maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. Can we just at least talk about it? It's uh, On the one hand, it does make me feel sympathetic to Tito because he is asking to have the right conversation. But on the other hand, it makes me kind of angry with him because we can't afford to have this conversation. We need action. We need to not be doing the things that we've been doing. We need to definitely not be continuing to do that. Anyway. I throw my hands up and, uh, and, and take my hat off to, to Tito for, I suppose, finding, finding yet a new level of, of absurdity where, where you have to reconsider uh, whether or not to throw good money after bad. I would love to be a fly on the wall inside of one of the meetings between especially Praveen Gordon and Tito Mbaweni. Praveen being like an honest socialist. So he didn't want to steal money like a lot of the Zoomerites, but he did want to uh, keep all the money in the government's hands. And uh, Tito Mbaweni has a slightly different picture of, of how to do things. And, I, and, and they've clearly been at loggerheads behind closed doors. But it's not just them. It's, it's so much of the ANC. So much of the ANC is not even beginning to think about how deep the hole that this country is in and how deep the hole of the ANC is in. One in four people voted for the ANC in the last election. And that's with Ramaphosa as president before he managed to show 
his inability to 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 genuinely reform. That's when he seemed like he really could come in with a with a broom and, and clean up the the last decade of the Zuma era. I don't know how they think they're going to grow their electoral base and how they're going to stop those who didn't vote last time because they were like, uh, we think maybe Ramaphosa is good, but we're not sure, but we don't want to vote for the opposition. But a very simple way for the ANC to get votes, the easiest way for the ANC to get votes would be in 2020, 20 empty, as many of my youth on the streets of Hillbrow like to say, has decimated business, has, has horrified homesteads to say, guys, it's a problem. We've run out of money, and here's what we're going to do. Top government officials are going to get a bit of a wage cut. They've been getting lots and lots of money. They're going to be fine. They're going to get a wage cut. That would be the single most popular thing I can imagine the ANC doing right now. There would be parties in Soweto. I'm sure of it. I know guys that would throw parties in Soweto right now if the ANC were to do that. And Tito clearly knows that too. And he clearly knows that it's not just a popular thing to do. It's popular because it's reasonable, because most South Africans are reasonable. So he throws this idea out there and look at the response that he gets. Consideration should be given to the hmm. proposal for the across the board compensation pay reductions to management level positions across national provincial and municipal governments, state-owned enterprises, as well as all other senior public representatives. <laughs> <laughs> so he's laughing because he knows that he has to get them to clap by encouraging it. And what he gets back is laughter and one or two, a couple of ANC guys clapping. But the most of them just having a chuckle behind their masks. And I know from people who were in the house that it really was just a couple who clapped and many more who laughed. Uh, and if you listen to it with the sound up, you, you can pick that up too. It's just crazy. This guy says, here's the best thing you could do. It is so easy. If you're earning, if you're a management level government official and you're earning 1.5 million Rand, take a hit. Say, I'm going to earn 1.4 million Rand. 1.3 million rand. You're still going to be able to send your kids to private schools and private hospitals and avoid using any of the government facilities that you're charged with running. But, you know, you might have to skip uh, uh, an international holiday uh, over the Christmas season and, 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 and go visit your family instead close by. It's such an easy win. And the response is laughter. This is where we are. This is our National Assembly. And take heed of what they find funny because it's you. You are the butt of their joke. I don't know, laugh, laugh along and then try and make a difference. But yeah, try and make a difference. And for our grand finale, I've got to just explain that this uh, special session of parliament uh, was hosted in a special way to observe social distancing. Uh, all parliamentary, all members of parliament are supposed to be there for, for an important speech like this. But uh, that was changed. And so more than half of them uh, were there virtually. I don't know if it was Zoom or Skype or what the platform was, but they were there virtually. And clearly throughout the talk, not everyone was uh, sensitive to the mic. And some people, you could hear like children and screaming and interruptions and like pass me some coffee or whatever. It's fine. I suppose people are getting used to a new system. But someone had something lined up for the end, which is just so strange and so childish and, and so theatrical and so absurd in the middle of what's supposed to be a very serious session where the country's confronted the fact that we have run out of money, that we're using money that we don't have to borrow money that we don't need to pay back the money that we've already borrowed borrowed to, 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 to keep the illusion that we're a proper country that's actually administered and not uh, a very sad case of uh, a nation being captured by a criminal syndicate. Uh, anyway, someone had a message to send afterwards and, uh, and, and I suppose the last bit of context, so, so what you're going to hear through, through your microphone, through your speakers, 
is what was being blasted throughout Parliament. They had very fancy speakers and so that if people were to raise a point of information during the speech or something like that, they'd be able to do so. Anyway, so just give a listen to this, to this, to this final bizarre ending. And bear in mind that the word wapapa is one of the most, uh, it's a very sort of common term. And it's tricky meanings like you've just woken up. There's a there's an irony about woke. Uh, it it kind of means something like woke, but it's but it's traditionally used to mean you are daydreaming. Like it, it's like you've just woken up and your brain is not the it's not firing yet, or you've just realized something but you haven't internalized it, or or most commonly it just means you're a fool, like you're being fooled or you are a fool yourself. And, uh, and that's probably going to be the last word that you hear from Parliament from the most important speech uh, in terms of hard numbers and money uh, in the year 2020. So we're going to play out to this one. And thank you so much for listening to us. And uh, yeah, hats off, uh, stay free, and uh, please support the Institute of Race Relations. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Hi, Minister. Papa. The papers tabled by the ministers ah, ah. will be referred to the relevant committees. That concludes the business for the day the House is adjourned. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs>